thank you, Professor Santuri, for this introduction. And um, it's really an honor and a pleasure to be again here. It was exactly almost one year ago when I was here for the graduation of uh, my daughter, Tala. So it's good to be uh, back here. Um, you know, there is uh, no other region, actually, in the world where religion and politics uh, interact, collide, and conjoin like in the Middle East. The region I come from, called the Middle East, by the way, I don't like this Middle East because it's middle of where and east of what, you know? <laughs> so it's only if you, live, if you live in Europe and you look at our region, you will call it Middle East. So I mean, there you already can see some colonial perspective in the naming. Uh, however, that region is the cradle of the three monastic religions, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. But also, uh, it is actually a region with diverse ethnicities, religious minorities, and multiple identities. And it is a region that was very much marked by over a century of colonial history, conflicting imperial interests, and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. In this lecture, um, I will try to uh, analyze actually three uh, uh, cases uh, that I would like uh, to focus on, um, uh, contemporary case studies. Uh, that all will show the use and misuse of religion in context of political conflict. The first uh, case study I will look at is the latest debate at the United Nations Security Council regarding the Israeli settlement in the West Bank and East Jerusalem. It's only like uh, that was in December last year. Uh, in the second case study, I will look at the interaction between religion and state in the Arab world in relation to power. And in the third, I will look at the role of Christian Zionists uh, in the current political context. So just to be balanced, the first case will focus on Jewish-Israeli case. The second will focus on an Arab-Islamic case. And the third on an intra-Christian Western case. After analyzing these uh, three case studies, um, I will try to draw three conclusions um, from a liberation theology point of view. So uh, let me come to the first, which is religion in the context of occupation, the first case study. Just to give you a short background so that um, those who are not familiar maybe with, with our conflict can follow me. Uh, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is the longest ongoing uh, conflict in modern history. Uh, this conflict actually has its root not in Palestine, but in Europe. It was exactly actually uh, 100 years ago, 1917, that Lord Balfour promised Palestine to uh, European uh, Jews. I always like to, under, to, to underline, it wasn't the Lord God who promised Israel the land. <laughs> it was the Lord Balfour. And believe me, there is a big difference between both, you know? So, uh, and why this promise, 1917? Uh, it wasn't out of religious conviction so much, but actually it was more uh, part of imperial, uh, politics of Great Britain. Um, so European Jews were supposed to go to Palestine, colonize the land, helping the empire to expand there. But also it had another uh, uh, reason because, uh, you know, uh, uh, the whole issue of the assimilation of Jews in Europe somehow uh, was not going the way many people wanted in Europe and so this was a way, actually, to solve this issue by sending European Jews to Palestine. So, but, so that's, it's, it's a political project, actually. And, but that political project had also some religious connotations, because uh, for many 
uh, Christians in uh, Great Britain at that time, uh, they were uh, actually uh, waiting for the second coming of Christ, and they thought that establishing uh, the state of Israel is a precondition for Jesus to uh, come back. Um, we, I would have loved to hear, uh, to have heard yesterday from Professor Ami something about that because, I mean, that's part of, of uh, evangelical theology. Uh, so, and that Balfour Declaration, actually, that promise was made when the uh, British troops were just outside Gaza, coming from Egypt, and they were ready to storm Palestine, and exactly at that moment, this promise was made to Lord, Lord Shield. So the colonization of Palestine was one outcome of the uh, First World War. Fast forward, the establishment of the State of Israel was actually uh, something that came after the Second World War. And it was exactly 70 years ago that the United Nations adopted uh, the, uh, um, uh, the resolution to, to divide Palestine into two states, uh, one Jewish state and one Arab state. And the Jewish state chose actually a biblical name, Israel, for itself. And the branding of the Israeli state as biblical Israel accelerated after 1967 when Israel occupied the West Bank, including East Jerusalem and the Gaza Strip. This is, I live in Bethlehem, so uh, this is when Bethlehem was occupied by Israel. I was at that time five years old. The name chosen for that war, 1967, Six Day War, uh, has also a biblical connotation like God who finished creating the creation in six days, Israel was able to finish its job by occupying the rest of Palestine before they can rest. However, 1967 didn't bring rest neither to the Israeli nor to the Palestinian, uh, on the contrary. And the longer the conflict remained unsolved with human intervention, the more it started getting religious connotation. So for a long time, it was a political conflict. But when political conflict cannot be solved politically, more and more people resort to religion. And so the outcome of the 1967 war gave a boost to Jewish religious nationalism and to messianic extremist Jewish group within Israel who started settling, building settlements. And settlements are big cities, actually, in the West Bank, claiming it as, as Judea and Samaria. So we see, you know, religious uh, fundamentalism uh, expanding after 67. We see political Islam, the same thing after 67, after the Iran revolution. And Christian Zionism also experienced a revival after 1967. And it's interesting, 1993, when Arafat and Rabin met at the lane of the White House, uh, here in the US and were ready for a political compromise, political solution, the opposition on both sides utilized religion to empty the peace agreement. So Rabin was killed by a religious Jewish Israeli person and Hamas started a series of suicide attacks on Israeli targets. Expanding Israeli settlement in Palestine became a tactic of Israeli government since then who have been subsidizing the building of settlements through soft loans, tax exemptions, and modern infrastructure. So this is just the background for the first case study I want to make. So the expansion of settlements in the West Bank, maybe you hear about it here in the news. This is what I will focus on. So on December 23rd, two days before Christmas last year, the UN Security Council met to discuss the expansion of Israeli settlement in the West Bank and East Jerusalem. A resolution, 2334, was adopted by 14 countries in favor and a US abstention. The resolution reaffirmed the Security Council stand that Israeli settlement have no legal validity and constitute a fragrant violation of the international law. The full text read as follow. I will just read um, 
portion of it. The Security Council, um, so the Security Council reaffirming its relevant resolutions guided by the purposes and principle of the Charter of the United Nations and reaffirming inter alia the inadmissibility in of the ac accusation of territory by force, reaffirming the obligation of Israel, the occupying power, to abide scrupulously by its legal obligation and responsibilities under the Fourth Geneva Convention relative to the protection of civilian persons in time of war of uh, August 1249, and recalling the advisory opinion rendered on July 9, 2004, by the International Court of Justice, condemning all measures aimed at altering the demographic composition charter and status of the Palestinian territory occupied since 1967, including East Jerusalem, including inter alia the construction and expansion of settlement, transfer of Israeli settlers, confiscation of land, demolition of homes, and displacement of Palestinian civ civil uh, civilians in violation of international humanitarian law and relevant, uh, relevant resolutions expressing grave concern that continuing Israeli settlement activity are dangerously imperiling the viability of the two-state solution based on the 67 lines. So, I mean, this debate was going on at the UN and I was watching it from Bethlehem, it was live. And it was really interesting because all, you know, the, the Security Council have 15 members, the five superpowers, and 10 other uh, countries that keep uh, uh, like revolving. And um, so all 14 council members uh, were talking and made their speeches based on Fourth Geneva, uh, Geneva Convention on international law and how important it is to abide by them. The U.S. representative explains the decision to abstain rather than to veto, usually the U.S. vetoes every resolution that has to do with Palestine. This time they abstained, and why? They said because they think that settlements are undermining Israel's security and eroding the prospect for a two-state solution, thus peace and stability. Once all 15 Security Council members were given the floor, it was time now for Danny Danone, the Israeli representative to the UN to address the Council, and this is what he had to say, and this is our case study. He's saying, uh, this Council wasted valuable time and effort condemning the democratic state of Israel for building homes in the historic homeland for the Jewish people. We have presented the truth time and again for this council and implored you not to believe the lies presented in this resolution. I ask each and every member of this council who voted for this resolution, who gave you the right to issue such a degree denying our eternal rights in Jerusalem. We overcame those decrees during the time of the Maccabees and we will overcome this evil decree today. We have full confidence in the justice of our cause and in the righteousness of our path. And then, I hope it will work. We overcame those decrees during the time of the Maccabees, and we will overcome this evil decree today. We have full confidence in the justice of our cause in the, and in the righteousness of our path. We will continue to be a democratic state based on the rule of law and full civil and human rights for all our citizens. And we will continue to be a Jewish state, proudly reclaiming the land of our forefathers, where the Maccabees fought their oppressors and King David ruled from Jerusalem. This holy book, the Bible, contains 3,000 years of history of the Jewish people in the land of Israel. No one, no one can change this history. I mean, I was struck the moment he rose the Hebrew Bible at the UN 
you know, Security Council. Uh, I mean, um, he did that. I mean, for a Christian fundamentalist, he would say, wow, I mean, the Bible was raised at the Security Council. But actually, what we see here is actually a politician raising a Hebrew Bible to undermine international law and the Fort Geneva Convention. And if we look at the words that Mr. Danone used, uh, he's so convinced of his own truth. We have presented the truth time again. He is convinced of the justice of his cause and the righteousness of his path. He uses words like historic homeland and eternal rights. He kept shifting between biblical Israel and the state of Israel of today as if they were one and the same. Proud live and reclaiming the land of our forefathers where the Maccabees fought their oppressors and King David ruled from Jerusalem. And then this holy book, the Bible, contained 3,000 years of history of the Jewish people in the land of Israel. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict is a political conflict over land and rights. The UN resolution clearly refers to international laws applicable in context of occupation. Mr. Danone doesn't address this issue. He avoided it on purpose because there is no human excuse to it, and there is no way that one can excuse the colonial expansionist politics. The last resort to defend the Israeli settlement policy is God. Mr. Danone is basically saying this, we don't adhere to international law, we do not abide by the Geneva Convention, we don't care about the Bill of Human Rights because we possess divine and eternal rights. Religion is here used to avoid the political solution and to religiously legalize, legalize what is politically an aggression. Watching this debate, I asked myself, how come that we arrived at, sit at a situation today where divine rights trump human rights? Is it possible to violate the human rights in the name of divine rights? Is it possible to use the biblical text to whitewash military occupation and the oppression of a whole nation? Can religious convictions lead to a severe violation of international law? The matter here is not about religious convictions, but rather how religious convictions are instrumentalized for political ends and how divine rights are utilized to allow for the violation of human rights and to avoid solving a political conflict. And while Jewish Israeli are given land to occupy in the West Bank and in the Bethlehem region, we are stripped of any possibilities for expansion or natural, natural growth. So this is the first, actually, case study I wanted to look at. And we will think about it a bit uh, further later. Let me come to the second. Uh, the second case I would like to focus on, case study, is taken from the Arab Islamic context. You know, following the 1967 war, the defeat of the uh, pan-Arab ideology of Nasser and the loss of Palestinian land, the situation in the Middle East changed drastically. The war in 1967 was like an earthquake. It changed everything. And actually, all of the rulers you see, you saw in the, in the Middle East until recently, they all came to power following 1967. So in Iraq, Saddam Hussein came to, came to power in 1968, one year later. 1969, uh, military um, uh, cops saw Gaddafi take power in Libya, Assad, uh, 1970 in Syria, and then Sadat also in 1970. In all of these Arab countries around Palestine, there was only one political party, that of the president, and no other parties were allowed. Political diversity was not tolerated at all. Elections took place with only one candidate. It would be good for the states maybe next time uh, to have only one 
because you had difficulty to choose between the last two. So, so while, while political parties were forbidden, religious groups were not or could not be outlawed. The rulers used religious groups over and against each other. So Saddam uh, sided with the Sunnis, Assad with the Alawites, Sadat with the Muslim Brotherhood. So the only other place where people could gather without becoming suspicious under these rulers was in the mosque. The mosque thus became the alternative place for the political castle. You know, I, I, know I, I still remember as a child, we were always joking, saying in these countries, no one can open his or her mouth except with a dentist because that's unfortunately the, the case. So where political disagreement was not possible, religious space became the outlet for a kind of a subtle opposition. A critique of the leader was not possible, but criticizing the government was tolerated. The mosque and the political leaders were able to exist side by side for a long time. However, when the legitimacy, the legitimacy of the political leader was in question, he would then resort to utilize religious legitimacy to stay in power. The weaker the political leader became, the more daring religious groups were in their attempt to seize power. A good case here is Iraq. Uh, Iraq under Saddam Hussein was actually ruled by one and the only party, that of Ba'ath. The Arab socialist Ba'ath ideology was actually a secular ideology, not religious at all, developed, interestingly enough, by an Arab Christian with the name of Michel Aflaq. Although Saddam ruled based on the Sunni community in Iraq, all religious groups there were more or less free to perform their religious duties. In 1991, Saddam invaded Kuwait, a neighboring Arab and Islamic country, which isolated him in the whole Gulf region. As long as he was fighting Iran, he had legitimacy in the neighboring Arab countries. The moment he invaded Kuwait, he lost that legitimacy and needed one badly. This is when he resorted to religion. Actually, from a secular party, suddenly, he became so religious and added the takbir slogan, Allahu Akbar to the flag, which you can see actually behind him. It was clear that Saddam was losing many of his allies and wanted to gain, to gain legitimacy and support by adding an important Muslim slogan to the flag. Again, we see how religion is utilized for political purposes. In a post-Saddam era, ISIS adopted the Islamic Shahada, La ilaha illallah, on their one color black flag as a mean to get Islamic legitimacy and support. So religion, in this case Islam, was utilized as a tool by Arab political leaders to remain in power, while the same religion was utilized by religious movement to seize power. So the leader wanted to stay in power, so used religion to stay in power. The opposition used religion to overthrow him, basically. The current unhealthy relationship between religion and state in the Middle East has to do with the way the ruling regime on the one hand, as well as the opposition movements on the other, manipulate religion as a tool to exert control and unilateral authority, or conversely, to overthrow them. This means that religion is being exploited for political ends of control and access to power. And it's interesting that if we look at the Arab world, there is always a correlation between the terror of the state and the terror of religious groups. The more aggress aggressive the state regime acts against religious groups, the more extreme they become. In the clash between the state and the religious terror groups, marginalized groups pay a high toll and diversity is weakened. Often, religious and ethnic minorities are not a target per se in the Middle East, 
but Christian Yazidis and other groups become a kind of a collateral damage in the power battle between the state and the opposing religious movements. And so diversity is weakened, not, uh, I mean, b by this power struggle between the ruler and the opposition uh, using religion. I hope I was able to make my, my, my second point clear. I will come to the third um, and last uh, point. Um, Christian Zionism uh, is the third case study I would like to look at. During an international conference, which I attended in South Africa uh, in 2015, uh, commemorating the 30th anniversary of Cairo, South Africa, a delegation from Palestine was present, and one of the members of the delegation was Reverend Dr. Robert Smith. At that time, he was serving as the program director of the Middle East and North Africa at the ELCA and uh, moderator of the Palestine-Israel Forum at the World Council of Churches. Dr. Smith is the author of a book called More Desired Than Our Own Salvation, The Roots of Christian Zionism, which is his doctoral thesis at Baylor. During the conference, Smith um, and two other Palestinians were invited to speak at an evening panel organized by one of the South African Palestinian Solidarity Group. In his short input and after describing himself as a citizen of the United States and as a citizen of the displaced Shikaswa nation and the current resident in Jerusalem, Robert wanted to talk about the responsibility of international Christians to the Christians of Palestine and raised the question about why the Christian community in the world react to the suffering of the Palestinian community the way they do and why do they allow Israel to behave the way it does? And he mentioned three reasons. First, he says that, uh, I will basically, he's saying that most of the Christians in the world, they don't know that Palestinian Christians exist, to start with. Secondly, uh, he's saying Christians in the United States often have negative conceptions of Islam and Muslims. They operate out of fundamental fear of Islam and Muslims, along with the false understanding that the conflict is at its foundation religiously formed. That is a conflict between Islam and Judaism. Then he says, this is far from the truth. It is a conflict over land. It's a political conflict over resources. It is a political conflict over self-determination and decolonizing principles. And then he continued saying First, this. I would say, that the Christians in the United States, and I assume also in South Africa, often do not know that Christians are present in the West Bank, in East Jerusalem, and within the state of Israel. They have a false imagination of what Israel is and what Palestine is. They falsely assume that Israel is made up solely of Jews and that the West Bank is made up solely of Palestinian Muslims, but this is not true. And even if it were true, it does not excuse the actions of the state of Israel. Secondly, Christians in the United States and in many other places have negative conceptions of Islam and Muslims. They operate out of a fundamental fear of Islam and Muslims, along with a false understanding that the conflict is at its foundation religiously formed, that it is a conflict between Islam and Judaism. This is so far from the truth. It is a conflict over land. It is a political conflict over resources. It is a political conflict over self-determination and decolonizing principles. It is not, first and foremost, about religion, although the continuation of the political conflict brings us closer to very dangerous religious conflict. And finally, Christians in the United States and in many other places, and I've heard many South African friends this week tell me, are influenced by the imperial theology known as Christian Zionism. Christian Zionism is, first and foremost, political activity 
It is not really a theology. It is not a commitment to doctrines and principles of faith. It is a political ideology that supports Jewish control over the, the land that now contains Israel and Palestine. Empire seeks to divide us from one another. Empire seeks to divide Palestinians from one another, dividing family against family, neighbor against neighbor. But our shared struggle and our shared resistance unites us and disrupts the, the desires of empire, tells empire that we will not be divided, that we seek freedom for all. It is essential that all of us understand that the Israel of the Bible, the ancient Israelites, are not linked in any substantive or material way to the contemporary modern state of Israel. The biblical narrative of Israel has almost nothing to do with contemporary Israel other than the intentional manipulation of sacred text to justify a political project. We must reject the theological justification for the present acts of the state of Israel, and we must instead draw from our sacred texts, the Quran, the Torah, the Tanakh as a whole, and the Christian scriptures to instead inform resistance to empire that is faithful to our traditions. So this was part of his presentation and um, you know, you can agree or disagree with what Robert is saying, but uh, three weeks ago, Robert Smith became a target for a social media smear campaign orchestrated by an American Christian who described himself as a media analyst. Uh, analyst. The smear campaign uses a quote from Robert Smith, um, f a presentation in South Africa that reads, the biblical narrative of Israel has almost nothing to do with contemporary Israel other than the intentional manipulation of sacred texts to justify a political project. In any debate about any Christian doctrine, theologians can speak their mind, critique almost everything. I mean, one can question the existence or non-existence of God, many theologians do that, the divinity of Christ, the histor histor historicity of any biblical story, but dare anyone question anything regarding the state of Israel, because there are watchdogs. It seems that when it comes to the issue of Israel, neither religious disagreement are allowed nor diverse political opinions are tolerated. Even worse, every credible theologian or researcher who dared to question the religious aura of the state of Israel become a plausible target for all kinds of Israeli watchdog groups. And the Israel lobby is very clever because they don't do the attack themselves. They send these Christian Zionists to do the attacks, uh, like we see here. Um, if one follow the smear campaign done over two days, one would notice the following. The campaign is intended to scare Robert so that he starts censoring himself. By mentioning Notre Dame University, this is now the current employer of Robert Smith, in the campaign, the university is dragged into the issue and will either exhort pressure on, Rob on Robert or even fire him. I know some of you experience that in, in your colleges. It's not something that it's done only here. One religious or political view on Palestine can therefore cost people their job, reputation, and come close to a character assassination. And I know what I'm talking about because you know I receive lots of these death threats all the time. But last but not least, there is no room for dialogue or diverse opinion or academic or political disagreement at all. The message is not debated here, but rather the messenger, the messenger is targeted. And this is the tactic of many Christian Zionist groups against Christian again. This tactic 
comes close to radical Islamic group that cannot tolerate modern Muslim critical thinking by declaring them as kafir, that is apostate, and thus deserving the death penalty. Killing, as well as character assassination in the name of God, becomes a religious duty. It's something, I mean, that really has to make us think about, about what's happening here. So these are quickly the three case studies, and let me come with three short conclusion out of uh, liberation theology uh, concepts. The first point I would like to make is on divine uh, and human rights, divine rights and human rights. In context of conflict, as in the Middle East, groups often utilize divine rights to deny other equal human rights. We find these groups within all three monotheistic religions. These are not only Islamist group in Iraq and Syria, but also Jewish groups in Israel, as well as Christian Zionists. Two forces are currently violating the human rights in our region, so-called security states, who don't allow people to move, to have an opinion, to publish controversial books or question policies, or simply to think critically, and religious movements who leave no room for people to choose their beliefs and to breathe freely. Both forces, the state and the religion, create system based on fear. The fear of the state and the fear of God become two sides of the same coin. A society that is based on fear rather on freedom, uh, on freedom kills the soul and the spirit of its people, their innovation and their creativity. There will be no future for the Middle East until we break out from the bondage of the security state as well as of oppressive religious laws to a wide open space where human life and security is protected human security is protected, where freedom is free to blossom, and where human rights become sacred. For us as Christians, a spirituality of liberation is a spirituality of creation and incarnation. Spirituality of, of creation means all people are created equally in God's image. In fact, all three monotheistic religions could agree on this, theoretically. As Christians, we believe also that in Christ and in Bethlehem, God became human so that all human lives is sanctified. Such a theology of liberation is essential in our region today. But in today's world, we adhere also to the universal declaration of human rights that clearly states that all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. I mean, we cannot go back to a time before the Universal Declaration. It should not be acceptable by religious or political terms to violate human rights in the name of divine rights or to play God against the humans. Groups who do that are misusing the scriptures for their own political ideology. The scriptures and the human rights charter are there for one and the same reason to defend the meek, protect the rights of the weak, put limits to those in power, and to make sure that the state adheres to the laws. So both religion and state have to ensure that the power of law and not the law of power prevails. No religion or human legislation is entitled to give the Israeli more rights than Palestinians. Muslims more privileges than Christians, or men higher wages than women, although I know this is done. Equality is something we cannot compromise on, neither religiously nor secularly. So that's my first point. My second point had to do with the cross, and this is part of my, my newest book that just came out this week, so I make some advertisement. Uh, uh, the Cross in Context, Suffering and Redemption in Palestine uh, came out just this week. Uh, the Cross as the ultimate critique of state and religious terror. 
For too long, I think we have tried to spiritualize the notion of liberation in the Bible. We replaced liberation with salvation, and the cross became nothing but atonement. I think we have to put the cross in its original context of political and religious violence. Jesus was one of the many who experienced on his own body the violence of both state as well as religious terror. The cross is a permanent reminder of the millions of people who are persecuted either by the state or by the religious establishment because they raise their prophetic critique to an unjust ruler or to a corrupt form of religion. The cross is a reminder of all those innocent killed in the name of God. There is an urgent need today to discover this dimension of the cross. The fact that Jesus died on the cross by a combination of state and religious terror is of utmost importance as a critique to both powers. The cross thus becomes the ultimate critique of state as well as religious violence. The cross becomes a mirror that shows God's vulnerability and the cruelty of political and religious behavior. For the peoples of the Middle East who are living either in context of Israeli occupation or in context of political despotism or affected by the daily use of religious extremism, this dimension of the cross is of utmost importance. Both religion and the state must be under the rule of law as a mean of protection from political despotism on the one hand and from tyrannical and repressive religious extremism that bans what it dislikes and legitimizes what suits its ambitions on the other hand. The role of the state is to safeguard the right of all its citizens. On the other hand, religion has an important role to inspire its follower to be compassionate. Securing human dignity and well-being of the people is at the core of religion and the ultimate goal for statehood. There is a dire need for a prophetic and dynamic faith today that does not run away or hide from the challenges of the society, but instead engages the society for the good of all citizens. The alternative to state and religious terror is a society based on civil laws, freedom, compassion, equal citizenship, irrespective of one's religious convictions, cultural identity, socioeconomic status, or race. And last but not least, a vision for a world marked by diversity. The story of Pentecost in the book of Acts, chapter 2, is imperative to understanding the spirituality that is needed in the Middle East because it provides a counter-narrative to the logic of the oppressive regime. The narrative of the oppressive regime is found in Genesis 11 in the story of the Tower of Babel, where a mighty empire with a strong economy reaches to heaven and with one language holds the empire together. This is exactly what Alexander the Great and the Greeks tried to do with imposing Greek and Hellenistic culture on their conquered peoples in the Middle East. Alexander had the ambition, pl ambitious plan to pour all tribes and groups into one gigantic melting pot. The outcome of this forceful unification was utter confusion. The empire fell apart and dissolved. The Roman tried the same experiment with no more success. The Byzantine emperor Constantine thought that by forcing one creed at Chalcedon, he could unite his empire behind one emperor and one faith. The Oriental identities and expression of faith in Egypt and Syria and so on were declared heretic and were persecuted. The Arabs tried to push their language on to the Berbers of North Africa and on Central Asian countries, which led to the opposite effect of less identification with their empire by those tribes. This issue is central for a Middle East which is pluralistic in nature. No single empire has been able to force the region into uniformity. There was never one single Catholic church 
that monopolize the Christian faith in the Middle East, like in Europe, for example, but rather national churches, Copts, Syriac, Maronites, Greeks, etc., each worshiping in their own native language and possessing, as they do today, a distinct cultural identity. The same is true for Islam. It too has different expressions according to different regions, Shiites, Sunni, Alawites, Druze, etc. All efforts to forcefully unify them have come to naught. The Middle East continued to be one of the most diverse regions in the world with multiple ethnicities, religious affiliations, and plural identities. For any empire, this was and is both a challenge and an opportunity. A challenge because the region resisted all attempts of forceful inclusion, but an opportunity because the empire was forever keen to play one group against the other and ensure that the region remained preoccupied with internal fightings so that the empire job of control was easier. This is part and parcel of colonial history in the Middle East. In this context, the story of Pentecost shows an alternative vision of the region by reversing the story of the Tower of Babylon. Jerusalem becomes the counter-narrative of Babel. Here, various nations and cultures meet. They don't speak the language of the empire, but rather their own native language. Their identities are respected and embraced. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit, provides the software for communication so that they understand each other. It's like with the new mobiles, I think. Uh, if, if they had mobiles this, with, with this translation capability like today, um, this would have been easier. Uh, but this is what the Spirit did uh, in Jerusalem uh, 2,000 years ago. In this story, the rich diversity of the region is embraced and celebrated. It is regarded as strength rather and as deficiency. The multiple identities of the region are viewed not as contradictions, but as a treasure to save. In Jerusalem, 2,000 years ago, the people from the whole Oikumene stood on equal footing. Parthians, Maidens, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya near Kyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts, Cretans and Arabs. The moment Pentecost was taken out of its original context, it became a nice story without any particular significance. It became a tale about speaking in tongues and thus lost its contextual relevance. The church born in Jerusalem was meant to counter the empire, not by creating another empire, but, provide, but by providing a new ecumenical vision. The spirituality so urgently needed today more than at any other previous time is one that embraces diversity and celebrates it as strength. So to sum up, a Christian spirituality of liberation is crucial contribution not only to the survival of the Christian community in that part of the world as such, but is crucial for the future of the Middle East at large, ensuring that human rights are protected prophetic critique is raised, and diversity is celebrated. And I think this is exactly our role as Palestinian Christians in that part of the world. Thank you.